So just an update on BFR itself. So th the design, uh, the, the production design of BFR is different in some important ways from the, what I presented about a year ago. Um, overall, it is 118 meters long. Uh, the payload is still is similar. It's about 100 uh, metric tons. Uh, that's 100 metric tons to, well, actually, technically 100 metric tons to all the way to Mars because of orbital, uh, orbital refueling or, or orbital, orbital retanking. So um, BFR is, able to, is designed to be able to take 100 tons all the way to the surface of Mars or to any, well, surface of Mars, maybe Ceres. But, but if you have a, a, a propellant depot on Mars, you're able to get from Mars to the asteroid belt to uh, the moons of Jupiter and kind of like planet and moon hop all the way to the outer solar system. So BFR is really intended as um, an interplanetary transport system that's capable of getting um, from Earth to anywhere in, in the solar system um, as you establish propellant depots along the way. Yeah. So we, we've um, increased the payload section to be over 1,000 cubic meters. I think it'll probably end up being probably so something around 1,100 cubic meters. <clears throat> there are um, forward actuated fins and rear actuated fins. The, the way that BFR flies is somewhat counterintuitive. If you apply your sort of normal intuition, it, it will not make sense. Um, I'll try to illustrate that in this presentation. So there's the two forward actuated flaps, and then there are two rear actuated wings or fins or flaps, depending on what they're not exactly comparable to anything else out there. Um, but you, you kind of want you want, kind of want four control surfaces to to be able to control the vehicle through a wide range of atmospheric densities and and velocities. So the it, the, the way it operates is kind of more like a skydiver than a, than an aircraft. Uh, al almost the entire time when it's re-entering, it is just trying to to break. It's just trying to stop. So it's. Uh, it's doing everything it can to shed velocity while distributing that force over the most amount of surface area possible. So the um, t two of the three rear fins actuate. They're like giant wings. It actually requires an enormous amount of force to move those, to move those wings. It's sort of in the mega Newton um, class of, of, of force. Um, the, the, the third uh, fin or wing-like structure is actually d does not actuate, and, and it is not a vertical stabilizer as it may appear. It is actually just a leg. Um, so during the high-velocity portion of entry, it's in the lee of the wind, and um, it really doesn't have any aerodynamic purpose, and it's really just a leg. Um, it looks the same as the other ones for purposes of asymmetry. So this is a. A, a true physics simulation of BFR uh, re-entering. So it, it is mostly just <clears throat> coming in like this. Um, at, at a very high angle of attack. Um, in fact, one of the things that for the general public is a tricky thing to understand is that Orbit means you are zooming around the Earth at a very high speed. Uh, people, it's slightly, it's counterintuitive where people think perhaps um, once you get to a certain altitude, gravity turns off. This is not the case. Um, in order to go up and stay up, you have to move around the Earth at approximately 25 times the speed of sound. So, in fact, the space station is circling the Earth every 90 minutes. This is a very important concept to understand. 
that orbit is, a, is entirely about your speed horizontal to the ground or parallel to the ground. It is, an, it is going up and staying up is, it, the only reason you need altitude at all is to get out of atmospheric drag. So if Earth didn't have an atmosphere, you could orbit one meter or like 3.28 feet above the ground, no problem. Uh, well, a little dodgy, but it's technically possible. Um, so, so yeah, if you, if you looked at that um, simulation, um, it might be worth playing that again, actually. <laughs> so, you can see it's basically coming in. If, if this is the Earth, if this stage is the Earth, it's coming in like that. And, and it's just using its entire body to break. And, and it's, it's, it sort of goes like that and slows down, and, it, and then it falls like a skydiver. And, and then it rights itself, um, fires the engine, and lands on the fins. I mean, this will look really epic in person. And again, it looks like guaranteed to be exciting. Then you can see it's sort of falling, falling body first for quite a while. It's really quite, quite gentle. You're just sort of falling at terminal velocity for, for quite a long time. Very gentle fall, just sort of like floating down. And then it rights itself at the end, fires the engines and lands. It's, it's very counterintuitive. It's not like anything that people are familiar with. It's not like an airplane or, yeah. And then obviously, if you're landing on the moon, um, you don't need any aerodynamic surfaces at all uh, because you just, there's no, there's no air. Um, you just need thrusters. So next, the next steps with uh, BFR are, we're obviously gonna, we're going to build it, or we are building it. Uh, this is a picture of the um, main cylinder section of, of BFR. So BFR is nine meters in diameter. It's really quite enormous. You can, that, you can get a sense of scale. Like that is the, that's to scale. So that gives you a sense of, of the size of the vehicle. Quite enormous. Um, but we are, um, we're already building it. So we've built the first cylinder section. So that's the first actual cylinder section of the BFR prototype. And we'll be building the, the domes um, and the, the engine section soon. And then this is the Raptor engine. So this is the Raptor engine that will, will power BFR, both the, uh, the ship and the booster. It's the same engine. And this is a, a, approximately a 200 ton thrust engine. Uh, that's uh, aiming for a, uh, roughly a 300 bar or 300 atmosphere chamber pressure. Um, and depending upon, if, if you have it at a high expansion ratio, it has the potential to, be, to have an, a specific impulse above 380. Um, but it's a, and it's a stage combustion, full flow, uh, gas gas, for those who are interested in technical details. Um, like I really, this is, I'm really excited about this engine design. I think the SpaceX propulsion team has done an amazing job uh, on, on this engine design. And, and the, the SpaceX structure is an error. Like really, the SpaceX team has done a phenomenal job in design of this, of this. it's like super great. Like, well done guys. I mean, but, like this is, this is a stupidly hard problem. And SpaceX engineering has, I think, done a great job with this design. It's like, like I don't think most people, even in, in, the, in the aerospace industry, like, know what question to ask. Like, it took us a long time to even frame the question correctly. But like, once we could frame the question correctly, the answer was, I wouldn't say easy, but the, the answer flowed once the engine, once the question could be 
framed with precision. And framing that question with precision was very difficult. Oh, yeah, so this is the tra trajectory. So we'll, yeah, take off, uh, have booster separation, go into parking orbits, do a translunar injection, uh, fly around the moon, uh, and then come back and land. Yeah. That should take a few, you know, basically about four or five days. And um, it'd be very exciting. Very exciting indeed. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do a bunch of test launches uh, w without any people on board before having people on board, to be clear. Uh, we will, that's, it's going to be very important to test this vehicle thoroughly before putting anyone on, on board. Um, yeah, but I can't wait. Like, I'm super fired up about this. This is amazing.